The White Pill is available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us someone I've been meaning to get in the show for like years now. It's Raheem Kassam. Raheem is the author of No Go Zones. For years, he was Nigel Farage's um, right-hand man. And now you can find him at thenationalpulse.com, which is a prominent right of center news organization. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to discuss with you, but more specifically, I want to start with the Brexit stuff because you had a front row seat to something that not only was not supposed to happen, but was never going to happen. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. Uh, you're wasting everyone's time, Nigel. Uh, this is just something to promote you personally. You know, you're just grifting. Britain's never leaving the EU. Uh, contracts have been signed. We have to, you know, make this work. What are you going to do with Ireland and Northern Ireland? You know, part of it wants to be, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you saw all this from the beginning, I'm sure, being told this is just all those criticism and more. Um, how did you, can you talk a bit about having to stare in the, and knowing perfectly by the well, by the way, I'm sure the best criticism, which was true is the Tories aren't going to help you with this. You know, they're a complete waste of time. And it's like true. So can you walk a bit about what that experience was like? Because I think a lot of times people are of the belief that so many things that are, are in politics are impossible and they are impossible until they happen. And then it's like, well, it was inevitable. And it's like, no, you're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that happens. That's politics, right? And and by the way, uh, Michael, thank you so much for having me. Uh, long time admirer. Uh, for the audience that doesn't know, Michael is pretty much the first person that ever made me realize that I wasn't so serious and had to chill out. And yeah, uh, good. <laughs> yeah, and I've I've carried that I've carried that philosophy on very well, believe me. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say front row seat either. Like I was on the stage for that for that whole production, yeah. right? Yeah, and, right. And if Nigel Farage was was you know the leading character, then I was sort of one of his one of his entourage. Um, you know, in 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 the grand scheme of things, and and wasn't there from the very beginning, by the way, because people will remember the the real Eurosceptic argument had raged for decades and decades in Britain. I mean, my my one of my heroes, Enoch Powell. Um, was writing about uh, how Britain should actually vote for the Labour Party. I mean, this is a hard right Tory conservative, was telling people to vote for the Labour Party in the 1970s, because at least back then, Labour were offering a nationwide referendum on yeah. uh, the European community. Uh, and so it, it's got so much backstory. And then, of course, in the early 90s, Soros shorts the pound and uh, we dumped out of the European uh, exchange rate mechanism and all of this stuff and, and 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 boring, boring Westminster politics stuff. But then over that decade, along comes this party, the UK Independence Party, and they start, you know, pretty cringe, actually. Um, you know, purple pound sign logos, not and I don't mean like your pound sign, I mean, pound sterling. Yeah logos on on billboards saying you know keep the pound keep the pound and it's 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 pretty cringe like marketing and advertising but you know sometimes when you see those things and and they're advertising a product or or something to you and you think wow that's bad marketing but i'm buying that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so many people around the country start to flock to the uk independence party and in the early 2000s, you had Nigel Farage going uh, viral on YouTube for screaming at them in the European Parliament and Zero Hedge was covering it and then Drudge was covering it. And it got this, it built this head of steam and it, it felt sort of, it was it was dovetailing a lot with the, the, the Ron Paul stuff, right? The, the Ron yep. Paul revolution stuff. And Nigel was, you know, I, I guess like you, I, I think still correct, right? Was more of a libertarian figure, right? And well, I'm an and, anarchist, but yes, yeah. Uh, sorry, so. yes, um, but he was he was a, he was a lot more about leave us alone, that yeah. kind of mentality. 
And then I got my hands on him. <laughs> and I think I think the it was, that was 2015. And I think the word that the Times newspaper used um, back then to describe me was snarling, thin skinned and aggressive. And, and I wear it as a badge of honor. Um, and 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 we did it and, and we did it because that 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 last bit that we had to get over the line right you could have polled brexit at about a 35 percent maybe 40 percent issue a couple of years prior to the actual vote but that last bit that had to get us over the line that was the anger that was the aggression it yeah. was the frustration people were looking at what was going on in europe at the time remember the migrant crisis oh, yeah. millions upon millions of undocumented unknowns uh floating into the continent and it, it was kind of there was a there was a poster a brexit campaign poster actually at the time that summed this all up correctly um it was a big line of people like you see with the migrant caravans in the in the us right the big lines of people and it just read breaking point and that, that spoke to people because it wasn't just that the country or the continent were at breaking points, which they were, especially when it comes to the, the scale of mass migration. It's that people were at a breaking point. They were at a breaking point over Brussels meddling in our affairs. They were at a breaking point, obviously, in terms of migration. They were at a breaking point, the fact that they had a conservative party that was not conservative at all and was just yeah. going along with this, you know, welcoming Obama to London to try and twist the arm of Brexit voters to don't do it, don't do it. You'll go to the back of the queue in it for a trade deal or all of this sort of gibberish. And people broke. And on the day, I remember I voted uh, next to David Cameron, who was prime minister oh. at the time. We, we had the same polling station because um, I lived right next to number 10 Downing Street except I didn't have the gates and the guards. Um, and we walked in pretty much at the same time to the polling station, one after another. And he was he was over two, two booths away from me. And it was so funny because I knew, you know, he's ticking remain and I'm ticking leave and 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 history, history is ever thus. What were your techniques when you had to deal with these naysayers? who have no vision of things being changed in a very significant direction, who are ostensibly and will be glad to tell you, look, I'm on your side. I'm on your team. Give it up. This is ridiculous. Let's work with what we have. Uh, yes, David Cameron or you know any of these people aren't great, but we have to deal with the hand we've been dealt, right? Yeah, and that was the Conservative Party's philosophy about the EU itself, right? Yeah. Change it from the inside. Don't don't leave. It was it was there was a chap, terrible chap. People could look him up. His name was Mark Clark, and um, I say terrible chap, and people can look him up because it's well established in print media that he's a terrible chap, right? This is not my opinion. Um, he, he, the things that he did over the course of that time, he worked at the Conservative Party, and and he was their bully boy, right? And there was a Tory conference and I went along because all my friends were going along and Mark Clark grabbed me outside of the main lobby hotel bar that everybody was congregated in. I think I was outside having a cigarette and he came up to me and he prodded me hard in the chest and he goes, you are making a big mistake. You're making a huge mistake if you leave the Conservative Party and you join with Farage and you keep, they're going nowhere. They're going nowhere. And I just said, I said, hey, listen, as the Zen master says, we'll see, right? Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, you, don't need, you don't need to get all up in my grill about it. Um, and, and, you know, that's kind of the approach I took. And it's kind of the approach I take to everything, right? Here is my opinion. We'll see. I, I, don't, I don't know why you're jumping down my throat about it. Um, the, the 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 Conservative Party's philosophy, as far as staying in the in the EU, nearly worked. Right, it nearly convinced people that that we should give another give it another good old college try. Yeah. Right, um, but they the, made us commitments to us. It's going to be better in four years. See, yeah, it's working. But then, but then the EU basically came out and said we ain't changing shit. <laughs> so fine, we're gone. Um, can you talk a bit about... By the way, not that it's been a great success. I have to add that as well. The Conservative Party have done everything they can to ruin Brexit as a, as a, as a concept and, and not even follow through on the, on the promises made by the Brexit campaigners in the Conservative Party. Oh, yeah. What I want, one of the questions I want to ask you is, and, and this is going to be a tricky one, which has someone who's done a lot of work both in uh, Great Britain and in the States, which party do you have more contempt for? The Republicans or the Conservatives of the UK? 
Oh, it's so that's so tempting. It it would, <laughs> it would probably have to be the Conservatives because you know there's an old joke in the in the UK. You're walking along a cliff edge with a member of the Labour Party and a member of the Liberal Democrats. Who do you push off the cliff first? And the answer is Labour. Always business before pleasure, right? <laughs> and, and so I think if it's if it's between the Tories and, and 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 the Rhinos, I think it's the Tories. It, they are they are con a contemptuous. Um, I mean, frankly, I mean, you probably love all this, but 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 wantonly sexualizing everything in Westminster. You know, it's everything is about sex and young, especially young men and young boys inside the Conservative Party think. now. It's massive. It's massive, and nobody fucking talks about it, right? It's it's outrageous, um, and and. I just don't recognize it as being anything but like a a a brothel now. It's it's a okay. brothel of political ideas and it's and it's literally a brothel in some cases, right? Um the Conservative Party, if you ask your average Tory in the United Kingdom, um they will have never ever heard of um Peel or Disraeli or Burke. It's just not required knowledge. Wait, really? Disraeli? They don't know who that is? No. If I if I know who that is, how do they not know who that is? Are you serious? We're not taught it in our schools. That's not what's taught anymore. You know, we learn more about the Vietnam War, which we weren't involved in, yes, than yeah. our own history. That, that oh my god! That, that, so the, so are you at my age? By the way, I dread to think what's going on there now. Are you uh, black pilled about the future of the UK? Then, oh gosh, um, that would. I guess that would presuppose that I I acknowledge that the UK is still one entity, you know, and and okay. I don't, I just don't think it is. It what do you mean by that? Function like it, Scotland's devolved. Wales okay. Wales is mostly devolved. Um, the the Ireland question is now arising again. Of course, I'm a I'm a unionist in one sense, but but you can see the argument from the other side. And of course, we had so many problems with with. Irish nationalist terrorism in, in the 90s that, that people are genuinely concerned about a return to that. Um, England, I think, can be saved. Uh, I, okay. I just don't think the Scots will, will be a part of that equation for very long. Yeah, there's a lot of drama going on right now in Scotland. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon had been a master, frankly, at getting the SNP, Scottish National Party, from being some fringe party to being like a one-party rule. That's no joke uh, in any system. Uh, she just recently stepped down. Now there's some drama going on at the top with, is it like some kind of sex stuff? What's going on there now? Do you know what? I, I, I haven't even followed particularly the machinations inside the SNP for a long okay. time, but... I did say in 2015, I wrote an article about, um, what's his chops, the new leader over there, Hamza, yeah. Hamza what a, uh, um, I forget his name now. And I said at the time, I was like, you mark my words, they are going to make this guy the leader of the SNP one day. That was eight years ago. So I think he's read that article, it's just been waiting ever since. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about um, American politics, because mm. I am surprised not it takes a lot to surprise me in politics i, I am i've been surprised recently because the vitriol between uh trump people and DeSantis people is already at a 10. uh it's gotten very personal which I, i'm shocked at uh there was you know in 2015 16 you know trump going after jeb and trump going after everybody but i don't think it reached the level this quickly of like trump supporters on twitter versus like ted cruz supporters just really going for the jugular uh, if I had booked you for this show before you got involved in some of this, this drama, so this was fortuitous, but to get a little bit inside baseball, Gavin Wax, who had been formerly head of the New York City Young Republicans, I knew him uh, when I was in New York, he tweeted at Christine Peshaw, who is uh, uh, Ron DeSantis' press secretary, who, I'm also, who I also know, something to the effect of, like, like what's your effing problem? It's something like that. Seth Dillon, who runs the Babylon Bee, comes in publicly and says, you know, I don't like that tone. Uh, with that Babylon B in your masthead, so fired him publicly and on the spot. Um, you, so I just saw recently you were with Gavin. You hired him. Like, can you break down this whole situation and why it's so ugly so quickly from your perspective? 
It's one of those things where it's it's difficult to complain about from my perspective because I'm always somebody who's of the belief that like, you know, the gloves stay off, right? For okay. me, for me personally, MAGA hat stays on, gloves stay off, right? Okay, uh, that's, that's, my, that's my approach to life. So it's hard to complain that like going behind somebody's back to get them fired from their employer is an utterly devious tactic on the right and shouldn't be done and that we should condemn the people who do that because it's, cons it's, it's cancel culture on the right, right? Um, at the same time, hey, it's politics. Nobody promised you it would be it would be gentle and easy. And uh, you know, for the people who do want gentle and easy politics, I always say this: make a cup of chamomile tea, wrap yourself in a cozy blanket, and go and sit in the corner because this is going to be the most, I think, the roughest primary that we've seen in a very long time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I have a lot of problems with the Tallahassee operation. I, I like, I really do. I, I find it. I find these people objectionable for for many reasons not least because I've known them for so long and have been friends with them for so long. And as soon as this guy announces for president, DeSantis, they all start like mass attacking me and mass blocking me. And I'm like, hold on a minute, guys. Like, these are people who I used to go sit out on the Morton's, Morton's Terrace with, right, in DC. These are people who, until recently, I've been on road trips with. I mean, talking last oh, wow. year. Okay. Um, and so I take I take some personal umbrage at that, but hey-ho, you know, if you want a friend in, in politics, get a dog, right? Yeah. Um, the thing that I think we have always, um, acknowledged is that, is that politics and personal attacks and all of that stuff are pretty much on the table. I don't think we've ever seen a situation where you have, you know, a boss of a media company taking his advice from a political campaign to fire one of his employees. And that's what happened this weekend. That's why I, I took a car and I, I don't drive by the way. So I had, I had Vish Bura, you know, uh, George I know Santos, Vish, the, Vish. Yep. Um, Wrangler, Fixer, uh, Body Man. Um, I'm, try I'm still trying to get Vish to write a book that I'm telling him just should be called Body Man. Um, I think that would do very well. See, you know, conf confessions of a body man. And uh, we drove up to Philly and I picked this old mob restaurant called Dante and Luigi's because in 1989, Skinny Molino walked in with a Mac 10 machine pistol and shot Nicky Scarfo Jr. Uh, eight or nine times, I think it was, in the chest and torso. And I thought to myself, you know, it's, it's fitting, it's appropriate because they've tried to shoot Gavin, right? And the funny thing about that story is um, Scarfo didn't die and his father ended up putting out a hit on Molino. Molino ended up moving from Philly to Boca Raton, somewhere around about where Seth Dillon lives. So I just okay. thought like, that's such a great place to like meet. And I said to Gavin, I said, look, I think it's shit what they've done to you. Um, I have a great relationship with Gavin and, and the New York Young Republicans. I've spoken at their gala. I sit on their um, advisory board, voluntary position. And I've watched them change that organization from about eight rhinos three or four years ago to a I think they've got 1,200 members almost now, oh, paying wow. members. Um, and they have events like twice, three times a week in Manhattan. It is a formidable club. And I thought, listen, we can't have him, this guy who's done all of this work for the movement. You know, they go, they go electioneering, they go pamphleting, they go protesting. This isn't just a social club. Right. Um, we can't have him attacked. Um, so I kind of decided that, you know what, Gavin's a made man. I'm going to, he's, he's now under the protective umbrella, right? And if you come at him, you're going to come at the rest of us. And this has freaked them out. No, no end. Um, the, the thing that I find really bizarre about all of this is the Babylon Bee, as we speak to this day, still has not communicated with Gavin formally or informally that he's no longer working there. They just they just took him off the email accounts and the Slack channels. And I, if I'm the Babylon Bee's lawyer, I'm looking at that and going, uh, guys, like, you can't, that's not the way you behave. Um, so long story short, I said to Gavin over uh, lunch, late lunch, dinner, uh, you got a job here if you want it. He said, fine. And, and that's that's what we're going to do. Wait, so there's, I wasn't aware of this. There's some affiliation between Seth Dillon and the DeSantis campaign? Oh, yes. Oh, lots of affiliation. Yes. So so the DeSantis people uh, were hiring the Babylon Bee's lists, renting their, their email okay. list for tens of thousands of dollars last year. Uh, okay. In addition to that, Seth, I think, declared on a Twitter spaces this weekend that he has done speech writing for DeSantis himself. Um, and, and I think has been paid for that, he said. So there is a, a, a pretty serious relationship. I mean, if I had written speeches for Donald course, Trump, yes. and if I was, you know, if the Trump campaign were renting the National Pulse's list, and then I go and fire somebody 
because they were speaking, you know, they were saying the F word to the Trump campaign um, press secretary. I'm pretty sure people would say, um, follow the money here. This is this is shit. Um, and I just I, I don't know what the heck he was thinking. Hey, folks, breathe some light into your backyard with FastGrowingTrees.com this spring. From shade to fresh fruit to privacy and natural beauty, let FastGrowingTrees.com help you plant your dream garden with their expert advice and fast, reliable shipping. They curate thousands of easy grow plants, trees, and shrubs for your unique climate. Here's the thing. I tried them out. They're very smart. They sent me a free tree. If you go to the website, you figure out what your zip code is and your climate, you can determine what plants will thrive where you live and what plants will suffer so you can pick something that is appropriate for your own needs. It's hard to figure out which plant is which, and they've got a lot of information to help you make that choice. I love fastgrowingtrees.com because they sent me a cool chocolate mimosa, and it's great. And with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, you know everything will look great fresh out of the box. Join over 1.5 million happy Fast Growing Trees customers. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash welcome now. Get 15% off. 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash welcome. Let's get back to the show. Um, so let's talk about this. Like, Can you tell me from your perspective, you're obviously a hardcore Trump person given the choice between the two, um, what, I mean, would you be satisfied with DeSantis as a nominee? Do you think he's another Boris Johnson that he's like this globalist wearing MAGA clothes and, and hat? Like what, what's your take on this? So my take on this is, is may offend some, um, not because it's particularly offensive, but, but I think lumping people into this bracket people don't like, right? I cannot stand, and I'm sorry if you were a part of this at any point, I cannot stand the like intellectual dark web people. Okay. Um, I, I think that's so fucking cringe. It's an excuse to sneer at, at populists. It's an excuse to sneer at working class people. The, 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 the Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin, you know, Mm, mm, you know that approach to things puffing on a puffing on a cigar uh, 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 a a pipe like uh, like my old friend Douglas Murray you know and, and 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 I just don't like it it doesn't it doesn't sit well with me the arguments are not the right arguments it's it really is what's that strap line you use the speed limit right yes it really is speed limit conservatism and and the, the the DeSantis thing is interesting because I interviewed him on the radio in 2015 and I looked at his picture, I looked at his family and I looked at his Wikipedia profile. That was all the show prep I did. <laughs> and I said to him, wow, you really look like presidential material. And this was in the break, right? Off, 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 offline. And um, I'm worried that he took that to heart and this is all my fault. Um, <laughs> Well, you think about it, right? I'm the only hashtag per- influencer. Right, but I'm the only person who was in the official Brexit and official Trump victory parties, right? In the world, I was the only person with that, um, you know, with that sort of involvement in that. And I can't help but think that somewhere along the line, I'm just, I'm just accidentally involved in everything, right? Wait, can I hold on? Can I, can I, I, I have to top you on this one because the one credential I have that's like that, I'm the only person in the world who's been both in North Korea and at Charlottesville. Oh, wow. See, I was so at Charlottesville, a, but I wasn't in North Korea. There's a Venn diagram for you. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's a good one. Yeah, um, yeah so so DeSantis, I, I think, I've, I, and by the way, we've, we've spoken at the same events as well, small neocon events in, in Washington, D.C. You'll remember back in the day, I used to be a disgusting neocon. And um, I, I think people can obviously change, change their um, perspectives. But when I read his original book, you know, Dreams from Our Founding Fathers, and then I read the new one, um, you know, whatever it's called, I'm Ron DeSantis, vote for me. Um, I, th- th- he's not seemed to actually have learned anything. It's this old kind of my first principles, you know, ben- he, he keeps using that Benjamin Franklin thing up on the stage at the moment whenever he speaks. Oh, you know, a republic if we can keep it. Yeah, fine. That was like that was like what we were saying on talk radio 15 years ago. Yeah. This is not where the country is right now. Um, I agree with the sentiment, but it shows how sort of off you are. And by the way, don't dislike DeSantis. You know, I would say if he was the nominee, then people should vote for him because it's way better than what's currently at, at, uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, 
but he's not going to be he's not going to be Trump without the drama. He's going to be he's going to be Jeb Bush with some drama. Actually, is okay. the way that you want to be looking at this. He's he's very anti woke, and I get that. But that is that is and it's and it's good, right? It's good to be anti woke. But that is like congratulating somebody for not being a satanic communist, right? Like, yay, he's not a communist. Yay, he doesn't hail Satan. It's like, that's the that's the lowest barrier of entry for a conservative. And that's what he's running on. You know, Florida, where woke goes to die. We, every conservative state should be like that. I don't know why we think it's something that you should, you should necessarily be like, wow, this is it. This is what we need. You see, I like Trump. And the reason I like Trump is because he is a fucking sledgehammer, right? You can put him in front of any egregious situation and he is going to bang his head against it until one of them breaks, right? Yes. And sometimes he wins and sometimes he loses, but more often than not, we get our way, you know, that didn't happen at the end, right? During the pandemic, there are plenty and plenty of examples where towards the end of the Trump administration, things were not going well. I understand that, but that's why I keep saying, hey, you can... You can have another four years of a Trump that is now vengeful, and I want a vengeful Trump. And then you can have four years of DeSantis. But for whatever reason, Jeff Rowe and the consultant class in Tallahassee has decided, no, we have $80 million sitting in this campaign war chest, the state level campaign war chest. We're going to transfer it to the federal campaign and spend us, uh, you know, make us all a lot of money by spending that with us and our consultants, right? And they're the vendors. Of course they want him to run. They're making the money. And by the way, that's illegal. You can't transfer money from a state campaign to a federal campaign. So he's got trouble already, thanks to these greedy idiots. And and I really hope, I really hope that DeSantis doesn't do himself so much damage up on this primary stage that he can't run again in four years. Because by then, I think maybe, he's so young, I think by then maybe he will have established kind of stature and more credential that he can get up and say, I would now make a great president. But for me right now, it's not there. Um, one of the things, though, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I was on Alex Jones talking about this, and he hadn't heard this clip either. Trump, I believe in February or March, was on Hugh Hewitt, and he explicitly said, I'm not going to have vengeance against my enemies. I'm going to try to work together with people. And there's two ways, at least two ways to read that. One is he means it, and he's going to try to make nice with people who will never make nice with him. Or two, this is him trying to get in under the radar and be like, hey, I'm not threatening. And once he's back in the Oval Office, the guillotines come out. Um, yeah, I mean, which do you think it is? <laughs> I think it's one. You do? Yes. Oh, I, no. I think for I'll tell you why, and then oh, please, uh, I want to hear your thoughts. No. For all Trump's talk about uh, being, you know, this aggressive, and you got to hit back twice as hard, which he does when regards to tweets. I've seen during his uh, um, presidency very few examples of him being vindictive, uh, other than firing people he didn't like on his staff and punishing them for transgressing against him. There's no reason for him to be pardoning Rod Blagojevich, Democratic, former governor of Illinois, Kwame Kilpatrick, who uh, was accused of things including murder, former mayor of Detroit. Detroit's not going Republican, you know, to put, that's not, my, that's not, despite what we may hear, that's not MAGA country. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and I've seen there, I haven't seen any real examples of him, let's say, pardoning people who leftists really, really hate and would drive crazy, just as an example. So where do you see examples of him like, I don't see him leading the charge to prosecute Fauci, whereas I can see DeSantis doing that. And I want to hear your thoughts on, on everything I just yeah, said. Yeah, you know, it's, I had those same frustrations, um, not particularly about the pardons or anything like that, but, you know, about policy and personnel, I had my issues. Um, there was too much Jared, not enough Donald, sure. right? Um, I think he understood that. I think he got that. Uh, but the problem is, okay, if you're Donald Trump, and you're elected with a, you know, it's a mandate to mess things up, right? It's a mandate to go in and just like disintermediate the system. And then your options that you're presented with when you get into the Oval Office are right. You've got a class of uh, personnel here that is like uh, Breitbart world, right? Steve Bannon, right. blah, blah, blah. Then you've got a class of personnel that is Jared world, your family yep. and all of that comes with that. And then you've got a class of personnel that is RNC world, comes along with what's his name, Reince Priebus and all yes. of that, right? And so his job, and correct me if you think there's, there, there were any more uh, available to him. Well, that, that sounds fair. Yeah, those were the kind of groups that people were lumped yeah. into. So he took a little of Breitbart world, a little of uh, you know Jared world, and a little of um, establishment uh, RNC world. 
Because if he hadn't, <laughs> there wouldn't have been anybody to staff the damn government. Yeah. So you had a situation where these people were all fighting amongst themselves. And on, on the one hand, right, as the transition was happening in 2016, Jared and Bannon made an alliance. Then as soon as he got into the Oval Office, Jared goes and makes an alliance with the RNC and knives Bannon. You're in Charlottesville. Um, you know, you know how, how, how little Steve Bannon had to do with any of that, right? Right. And, and so... At that point, the Breitbart crew is out. They got knifed. They got done. They got handled. I'm sorry. I say that to Steve all the time. Like, you got rolled, dude. Um, publicly. Yeah, publicly. You got rolled. Uh, and, yeah. and that's politics, by the way. So then now you're left with these <laughs> these two uh, right. personal apparatus that comes from Jared and that comes from the establishment. So here's the point. Jared's out, and you've got the RNC waiting in the wings. The Heritage yes. Foundation, all of these guys waiting in the wings. The problem with the alternative, right, to Trump on this matter is Heritage is staffing the DeSantis campaign. Cruz okay. World is staffing the DeSantis campaign. RNC staff are staffing the DeSantis campaign. So if the argument is, and I think this is the argument, by the way, because it's not Donald Trump. I, ha I, ha I wrote this amazing, amazing article about this, and I will, I will call my own article amazing on this because nobody had written it before. Nobody had dug into this before. Did you know that... Do you know who Tom Price was? No. Tom Price was Trump's first health secretary. And okay. Tom Price was fired because um, he took too many uh, planes and it cost like the taxpayer $380,000 to get the health secretary across the country. And um, the Democrats demanded he was fired. So I went back and I went, I wonder who those Democrats were. And I looked. And I looked at their donors and all of those Democrats, their top donors are Pfizer, Moderna, you know, wow. all of those. Right. So then I was like, huh, who did they replace Tom Price with? Alex Azar. Alex Azar, the progenitor of uh, the task force, the COVID task force. Operation Warp Speed started with Azar. Uh, there was even a big back and forth as Trump tried to get rid of Azar. But Azar was great friends with Mike Pence. Why was he great friends with Mike Pence? Azar used to ran, run Eli Lilly out of Indiana. Oh, wow. Okay. So they knew each other from back then. So Pence empowers uh, Azar. And then when Trump finally loses it and gets up onto the podium, by the way, and says Mike Pence is now in charge of the task force, Pence doesn't remove Azar, who at the same time was sitting on an in, a biotech industry board with Pfizer, Moderna, oh, wow. like all of these other guys, Gilead, um, Abbott Labs, like all of the names that you started to hear yeah. during COVID were brought in by Azar there and, and, and therefore by Pence. And you remember, <laughs> here's my, here's the pinch on all of this, right? Donald Trump likes to put his name on everything, right? Put his name on hats, put his name on buildings, put his name on everything. But for whatever reason, it was never Donald Trump's task force. It was never the no, Trump right. task force. It was never Trump Operation Warp Speed. It was Mike Pence's task force. It was the vice president's task force. And then I started to look into, okay, well, how are decisions actually taken on that issue? And I, I, I called up a bunch of people who were working in the Oval, in and around the Oval, and in and around HHS and, and, NIA, and NIH at the time. And they, I, read, I read them my theory of the case, that basically Pharma got... Price fired, replaced with Azar. Uh, Pence gave him cover. Remember, it wasn't Donald Trump who put Burks and Fauci on the task force. It was Mike Pence. Mike Pence appointed them to the task force. They didn't even tell Donald Trump that that was happening when it happened. So listen, my, my long-winded argument to your, um, your thesis is this. Yes, uh, the people around Donald Trump in the last administration were 99 out of 100 of them untrustworthy rhino-like establishment shells and those people are all around DeSantis right now okay so you know my theory is and i hope i don't claim to have all the answers no actually i correct that yes i do um, I, I i think that a trump 2.0 administration is going to unload on all of those people. I mean, he's doing it now and people are crying about it, right? He's dumping out onto like Kaylee McEnany and all of these people who've been talking shit about him on Fox and all those other places for a while. And people are going, oh, you know, he's not vindictive enough. He's fucking vindictive as hell. Like he's he will, he will do what I think he needs to do. And, and this includes the Fauci stuff. I absolutely believe it includes the Fauci stuff in order to hold people accountable for what he currently perceives. And you have to understand, I've talked to him about this. What he currently perceives is the only blight in his first term was okay. the, the, the task force.
Folks, if you've been on the fence about buying gold and silver, have you seen what's going on around us? The Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, the government having to bail them out with our taxpayer money, Saudi Arabia meeting with China to accept the yuan for oil purchases. Is this the end of the petrodollar? And of course, Xi Jinping meeting with Putin in Russia. Behind the scenes, while we weren't paying attention, MasterCard, Citigroup, and other global banking giants have started a digital dollar pilot, what people are calling Biden bucks. Biden fast-tracked its development. What does that mean? It means that the Fed can monitor every transaction and devalue the purchasing power even more. Do you know where else they have digital money? China. China's digital currency helps the CCP punish or coerce citizens with their social credit system. And if a citizen commits even a minor infraction, they can be blacklisted from traveling, going to restaurants, renting a home, or even having insurance. And countries around the world are poised to adopt central bank digital currencies, which are programmable forms of fiat money, which allow central banks to track, trace, and even freeze a person's funds. And the corporate press wants you to watch Biden give away money to Ukraine. And there's plenty of presidential hopefuls announcing their bid for 2024 who are doing the same thing. And according to Bloomberg, the world is in the midst of a macroeconomic reset and the shining star is gold. Here's what you can do. You can call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late and mention my name, Michael Malice. You'll always get best in class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in fiscal gold and silver and you may be eligible for the no fee for life IRA on qualifying rollovers. All you have to do, call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide or go to malicegold.com. That's easy. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row. So call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide or just go straight to malicegold.com. Let's get back to the show. Um, what do you uh, um, do you think that he is going to be given a – this is the point I made to people who are Trump supporters. And, and if they're boomers, they just hand wave it away. And I know you're not going to because you're a strategist. They're my – Two things that I think he's going to have to face is there is now established a truth, I'm using that word as loosely as possible, in corporate America that because Trump fomented an insurrection and almost overthrew the government, it will be perfectly appropriate in their mind for me, I'm Mark Zuckerberg, to be like, I can't sell you ads because you brought about, you know, almost overthrew the country. So he has to face that. And he also has to face, and I got into this a little bit with Charlie Kirk, and I, I want to hear your opinion, the RNC, where they, th- the system works for them. They get their guys elected. They don't have to make any big cuts in spending. Uh, their people get to staff certain things. They alternate with the DNC, and everyone's happy. And he comes in, and this upsets their whole little kind of WWE uh, uh, charade that they have with the Democrats. Um do you not see those things as big concerns that he has to face going into the, the primary and the general? Oh, I, I don't think it will be an easy primary okay. or general. And I, and I don't think it should be, by the way. Like, I really do want him to debate. I, I, I know he's not inclined to. Um, because, and you can see it from his perspective. He's like 60 points up, right? It's like, why am I going to get on stage and let these guys just hit at me? I'm winning, right? <laughs> right? Um, it's, like, it's like when Gavin was um, uh, waxed to come back to the early earlier point when people were dunking on Seth Dillon in that, in that Twitter space this weekend, Gavin said to me, I want to go in there. I'm like, dude, you've already won. Like you don't, you don't need to go in and start, start maybe taking some L's. Um, I'll take your, I'll take your questions in order though, if, if that's okay on the, on the corporate America stuff. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I don't think, I don't think elections are won on Twitter or Facebook ads anyway. I mean, Donald Trump lost out in 2020, um, by about 70,000 votes across different counties in the, in the Northeast and in, 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 in the Rust Belt. And the reason he did was because there was a pretty poor get out the vote operation. Um, that was a combination of the poor campaign planning by people like Brad Pascal, as an example. Yep. Um, along with, along with you know, the, the Dropbox crap that they pulled in Democrat areas and uh, the Center for Tech and Civil Life funding that went into um, so many yep. Democrat counties around the country. And listen... They stole it fair and square, okay? That's what we have to accept. We, we just, again, we got rolled, okay? Like, learn that lesson, take that L, and hold it, right? And, and march to the next election with it. Um, but I don't necessarily think that the, the, the corporate stuff is, is going to happen. People don't really like major corporations in this country. Like, they don't like major... We see that every day, right? Bud Light does something. North Face does something. Target does something. Like, yep. the public is willing to fight those people every single day. And if they are all lining up against Trump, I think it is actually more grist to his mill, to be honest with you. Um, 
I think there has to, if, if he's going to win though, he has to have a good get out the vote operation. He has to lean into ballot harvesting, yes. has to lean into early voting. Like all of those are, are obvious and have to be done at this point. If you, if you win and you get in and you want to change the laws once you're inside, fine, you can do that, but you have to do it this time. Um, the RNC's point, I'm sorry, I didn't really follow. What was the, what was the, uh, the, the conclusion of it? So, meaning like, you know how in 2016, they basically, the Democratic Party did everything in their power to make sure Hillary got as smooth of a chance to the nomination as they could. They had the debates, you know, at 3 a.m. on Christmas and all this other stuff and, and basically made it a coronation, yeah. um, a word which in this country has a little bit more of a negative connotation than it does maybe back home. Yes. Um, so I can very easily see outlets like whoever the media outlets running the debates and the Republican National Committee uh, within their power and within the rules, certainly, but making things like, okay, if you don't agree to endorse the eventual nominee, you don't get to take part in debates. That's just one mechanism they used recently. Setting up rules that on the face are objective, but in practice are will be designed to be disadvantageous to Trump's campaign. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, I would say go full tilt against the RNC, you know, okay. like, uh, great. I, I, did, I don't like the Ronner endorsements. You know, I don't like the Kevin McCarthy endorsements. I know what he's doing, right? He's doing business. Yes. Um, and he's, and he's, as far as he's concerned, he's getting shit done. Uh, listen, if there were a better candidate than, than Ronner, I, I think he would have looked twice at it. But he, th that election, what did you have? You had Ronner and then you had Ronner's lawyer <laughs> running. You know, that was it. Um, so better the devil you know. I, I, I always feel that way anyway. Um, which is, by the way, how I feel in the Trump DeSantis argument. Also, writ large, better the devil you know. Because oh, I, I don't like a lot of the people. I, I don't like Jeff Rowe. I, I don't like these people like who came from Cruise World, who are all tied up with corporate America or running his campaign. I'm sorry, I don't like the people that he even launched his campaign with. I don't think it's a good idea for Elon Musk to be in China kowtowing right now. I don't think... Um, there's, there's good faith coming from a lot of the, and this is, again, this goes back to the intellectual dark web type situation, right? Like, I don't know how you feel about this, but the mind virus, the woke mind virus, I think that is a, such a fucking cringe way of dealing with this issue. Um, we're facing like actual communism, you know, full head on, right? But the potential for it, the idea of stacking the courts, right? The idea that, um, Biden can leverage the 14th amendment to get a debt deal done. This is, this is about leveraging the apparatus of the state for, for socialist end goals. Well, there's a word for that. And there's been a word for that for quite some time. Um, it's, it's that level of philosophy. I'm not saying that they're, you know, marching tanks down the street just yet, but Hey, <laughs> you know, we, we have to start somewhere. Hold on. Um, I got to interrupt you because they did in the, the 2000 riots, they did have more tanks down the street. Um, and they would be, my friend was a block away from them in Los Angeles. Uh, and they would certainly, if they had their drivers, brothers do so again, I think that's kind of unambiguous. They just don't need to do it yet. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Um, so yeah, I, I look, I did to come back to the point. I don't, I don't really have a problem with him aggressing the RNC and the RNC aggressing him. Okay. Um, let's, uh, there's something I also want to ask you about Farage, and this is something which I speaks to, I think speaks to the disingenuousness of the corporate press, um, which oh, is just something one, you and one, one, one more Please. thing on that point. Sorry. You talked about the debate and I didn't, I didn't necessarily uh, deal with that. If the RNC want to create stupid rules that he doesn't get on the debate stage because of, then he will just live stream at the same time as the debate okay. and pull a larger audience in. That's what I would do. Yeah, that's Sorry. fair. That makes sense. Um, one of the things you and I spoke about is that when Farage came into the Brexit scene, it had in some ways, um, I don't want to talk, sound like a reporter, but there were uh, uh, shadows of white nationalism. I, I don't know how to phrase it correctly. And Farage actually did a lot of work to kind of get rid of that whole element from the whole movement to be like, no, this is not what we're for, either publicly or privately. I'm not interested in that. Uh, if you and I, I had Sargon uh, on the show a few months ago, I don't know mm. if you're friends with him, but the point I'm, you know, when he's when people who are anti, you know, anti mass immigration are accused of being racist, I'm right. like, I'm quite confident that if a million Germans showed up in London, you wouldn't be, you know, breaking out the strudel and applauding <laughs> that you would consider this to be a major problem right. uh, as well, regardless of the color of their skin, especially um, if it were the French. Right, right. I, I, like it's just like this is nonsensical. Like no one in no one in UKIP is like, come on, let's bring over everyone who's from Marseille and just right. plop them in here and and, and teach them our language. Um, can you talk? But the thing is, if you read any uh, corporate journalist narrative, 
It's that Farage is a closet racist. This mm. was done for racist reasons. And he never does get the credit for that. Can you discuss that a little bit? Because I think that's something that you're not going to hear in, in, in regular outlets. And I think that's something that is extremely historically relevant and interesting. Well, listen, to, to use the parlance of, of 2015, can I be a bit of a snowflake for a second? And, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and complain about something. Um, I'm treated as like a white man. Uh, people like all these reporters who talk about this stuff, right? Like I was Nigel Farage's senior chief of like senior advisor, his chief of staff. I'm a brown man from a Muslim family. And they would never, ever tell anybody that even to this day, when the left media reports on me, they do their hardest, they try to hide my name in the articles, right? They try to like, Oh, you know, the National Pulse, white nationalist website, you know, all of this stuff. I'm like, fuck are you talking about? Like, so so it's interesting in England because, you know, English nationalism is really what what UKIP projected um mm -hmm. early days, um, which is which is basically a combination of um gosh, I'm trying to think of what the best example is here, but it's like it's like poetry in a field on a spring day plus football hooliganism, right? Like that, <laughs> that's English nationalism. The okay. yin and the yang. Yes, yes, <laughs> the balance, it's the algorithm. It's, it's, it's the Smith and the Neo in the matrix, right? <laughs> yeah. And an English nationalism is an extremely potent force because, because English people are very proud of being from England. And, you know, we do the, we do the, you know, England till I die at the, at the football matches and all of that, right? Um, they cannot, the reporters, these undereducated or probably overeducated, right? But to the point of broken, um, reporters don't understand the difference between like English nationalism, civic nationalism and ethno nationalism. They just don't. I mean, sorry to bring this bad, bad man back up, but Enoch Powell gave a speech in 1968 that was extremely famous. It was called, ended up being called the rivers of blood speech. And he said, like the Roman, I foresee the river Tiber foaming with much blood. And he was talking about uh, the effects of mass migration. And of course, what did the literalist, small pea-brained media and political class in England, by the way, and here's why, because they stopped teaching the classics at that point in schools. What did they say? They literally said, like, he thinks rivers of blood will be pouring through the streets because of migrants. Whereas what he was doing, if anybody knows, is he was paraphrasing Virgil's uh, Aeneid, right? And in the Wait, Aeneid- hold on, I gotta interrupt you because I think you're giving them a level of honesty that they don't deserve. I think if, if every school, school child in Britain learned the Aeneid, they would still pretend he said rivers of blood and not put in context. I disagree because I think if every school child in, in England learned the Aeneid, then um, a lot of people wouldn't grow up to be these dickhead reporters, okay. that's right? That's, that's true, okay. You can you can avoid, it's like saying, you know, we would have never no, had Tony Blair as prime minister were it not for the second world war. We lost yeah. all of our good stock, right? Right. Okay. And, um, you know, he Aeneas goes to the prophet Sybil in um, in the book, and Sybil says, "You must establish a city in a foreign land, but just so that you know, when you do that, um, there will be much blood." You know, to what she's talking about is toil. What she's talking about is is disturbance and sweat and hardship and 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 all of that. And that's what. Enoch was saying in 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 the Rivers of Blood speech, but of course they they misinterpreted him. You're completely right to say this. Nigel Farage went above and beyond, even becoming a a target of attack by the ethno nationalists, um, because he he ousted uh, British National Party members from inside UKIP. He refused to do any deals um, with groups like the National Front, and in fact, you know Enoch was once, and I keep saying Enoch because because Enoch was really the the proto Farage, right? Um, yes. He he was he was Goldwater to Farage's Reagan, right? And and in fact, the British papers. When I researched for my for my book about Enoch, uh, I found that the British papers had actually called him uh, Britain's answer to Barry Goldwater at the time. Oh which wow! Okay, that's a cool little thing. Yeah, and because I have. Barry Goldwater pictures all over my house and I have Enoch Powell pictures all over my house and I didn't realize that back then they were juxtaposing the two as well. Nerd. Um, <laughs> well, I'll, so, I'll, wait, hold on. I can out-nerd you. You know, during the 64 campaign, they made bottles of gold water and Barry no Goldwater way. tried some and he said, this tastes like piss. 
and the the can that I got on eBay is now displayed at the Goldwater Institute, uh, where it says courtesy of the Malice Collection. Okay, wait, hold on. Can you entertain the audience for one minute while I go grab something to show you? Of course. So I'm sitting on a plane once. I'm sitting on a plane, and um, a private plane. And this guy is across the aisle from me. And I look at him, and I, I turn to him, and I said, you look a lot like Barry Goldwater. And he says to me, I should hope so. I'm his son. <gasps> Gold <laughs> oh, they did not have a good relationship. Yeah. And so we had a, uh, I heard all about it. <laughs> and so oh. uh, we had a long plane ride together where we talked about his father so much. And at the end of the thing, he said to me, he goes, I'll never forget this. He goes, thank you. You taught me more about my father than I think I already knew. <laughs> and he took my home address and he sent me this. And this is a, a, a book, a coffee oh, table wow. book of Barry Goldwater's photography in the Arizona desert. And very cool. Um, you know, he wrote me a little, he wrote me a little note in here somewhere. Um, I don't know if I can find it. Yeah, so uh, for the, you know, that's his, that's a sign from his son. Very similar signature too to his dad. Here's the thing yes. people don't realize this. Bear Goldwater was a pilot from a very uh, time when piloting wasn't something commonly done. And he would take his plane and he was very close to the Native Americans of Arizona nearby. And he would take photographs of them. I think he was made an honorary member of one of the tribes. Photographs yep. of the Arizona wilderness. He really loved that land. Very yeah, much. I think it was the Navajo. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Anyway, just just nerding out there a little bit. But yeah, I mean, Farage, Farage, um, e Enoch refused. The National Front approached him when he was kicked out of the Conservative Party in the in the late 60s. The National Front approached him in the early 70s, asking him to stand as a candidate for them. And he gave them the same same attitude that that Nigel Farage, who ironically has uh, the initials NF, the same yeah. as the National Front, um, you know, gave him gave him two fingers, said absolutely fucking not. Folks, Michael Malice here, podcaster, author, and yes, underwear model. Sheath is something that I wear every day. And the great thing about sheath underwear is that they have dual pouch technology for both parts of your anatomy. They also have a girl's line. I don't wear that stuff. Dave Smith might. Go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code Malice. You get 20% off. It's great underwear for when it's cold. It's great underwear for when it's hot. And I wear it every single day because it's the best underwear I've ever worn owned the first time they've run to the studio i was like what is this and now i swear by it and in fact i model for them it's got added comfort added performance added mobility and there's something a little subversive about talking to someone while the whole time your underwear is cupping your junk i'm not gonna lie i do enjoy that aspect of it and folks they're not just an underwear line sheath now has bamboo hoodies and shirts which are really really soft so go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off your order. Support the underwear that supports you, and that supports the show. Does it bother you? There's this something that's interesting here, because there's never been a history of Nazism in America uh, to any kind of large extent whatsoever. However, you did have things like the National Front in Great Britain. Great Britain is a lot closer in many ways, politically and obviously geographically, than the United States are to the rest of Europe. And a lot of those horrific ideas from Europe have spread to Great Britain. There are many people in Great Britain politics to this day who will proudly identify as socialist, something virtually no one other than Bernie Sanders or maybe AOC would, would identify as here in the States. And it's not radioactive at all. So I want to hear your thoughts on how in the States, you know, everyone is considered a Nazi if you're kind of to the left of Mitt Romney, as opposed to coming to a country where you guys, you know, Thatcher would talk about this constantly. She goes, we were the only ones against Hitler. For not, for not a short amount of time. And it was very, very scary. It was, uh, you know, he had all of Europe and we stood alone and we're getting the crap bombed out of us on a nightly basis. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's generous to say, you know, that socialism is, is um, acceptable in, in England. It's, it's, it is a socialist country. Like you yeah. have to okay, understand yeah. this. Like the, it's not like you have a national healthcare system that is, whatever you can complain about the state running that to some level no it's it's a an aggressive monopoly yeah like you may not operate a private version of this or we will either put you out of business or we will subsume you right and like, everyone will cheer yeah yeah it's the biggest voting block in the country the national health service it is the um third or fourth largest employer in the world you know, behind oh, the okay. Indian Railroad and the Chinese Standing Army, um, and I think I think Walmart is up there as well. <laughs> okay, um, and 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 people don't realize this. It's a religion, 
in the United Kingdom, right? If you say anything bad about the NHS, even even when I was running in, in, in Nigel Farage, when he stepped down, I ran in that UKIP leadership election for about 20 minutes, right? And you... Even when I was running, I wasn't allowed to talk about what I really thought about the NHS. You can't, you can't say that. They'll pummel you to dust for that. Um, everything, everything is central controlled. Everything is is, and and it's so bad the way we run our constitutional affairs. We run them as if we don't have a constitution. And if you've ever read Badgett, you understand that England actually does have a pretty robust constitution. We just ignore it. We yeah. just fucking ignore it. And we don't, and we don't pursue constitutional. Um, you know, rectitude through our courts ever, you know, in America, you, I, you know, I could walk out on the street here and, and throw a, throw a rock and hit somebody with a case in the Supreme Court, right? Like, Americans actually challenge their government routinely. Um, and Brits just don't do that. I was talking to a friend of mine this morning, and he's just been cancelled, right? Uh, he was a college professor, and they've just fired him for being a conservative, like he just said, migration is slightly too high, and they got rid of him. And I told him, you need to get angry and you need to get aggressive and you need to start punching back at these people. Yes. And he said, and he said, I said, no, Raheem, I am very angry. I said, you're not angry. You're cross. You're cross. You're a little cross is what you are, right? Get fucking angry. And it's the difference between uh, being cross and being angry is like the difference between calling yourself sick, like unwell, ill, or poorly. I'm a little poorly. Yeah. I'm you know? under the weather. And I just said, I just said to him, listen, man, like the problem is you're cross. And he went, fuck, you're right. I'm cross. <laughs> it's that kind of country now. Yeah. Cause he's see, from, I bet you in his head, he's seeing things from their point of view, as opposed to realizing these people are evil and have no souls. And therefore anything that I do wrong against them is morally approved. Compassion for the devil is not something that I, exercise, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, here's something I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, uh, which media apparatus is worse, Great Britain's or the United States? Because I think they're both uh, inherently corrupt and unsalvageable in many ways. The BBC, uh, it seems to me as an outsider, yes, they're very, very hard left. But at the same time, I've seen many examples of them challenging leftist politicians with very hard hitting questions. Uh, and their reporting in terms of just general reporting, getting information seems to be absolutely world class. Um, so how would you compare the two media uh, um, kind of atmospheres, uh, ecosystems rather, the US versus the UK? Well, so the problem with the BBC is not that it doesn't do good reporting every once in a while. The problem with the BBC is most of the time it's regime propaganda, right? Yeah. And, right. and, and the regime is NATO, right? Like it's, it's, it's that. Um, it's also enforced by state monopoly threat of right. fine and jail if you don't pay for the BBC and you watch it. Seriously, for those that don't know. And I know we talk, you and I have talked about this stuff for to decades and decades. But for instance, I met somebody last night who didn't even know that Donald Trump used to be a Democrat. You know, people in their early 20s probably don't know a lot about um, the history of organizations, institutions, and, and people that, that we've yes. fought these fights for so very long. But the short answer to your question is it's way worse in America. It's way, way worse okay. in America. Okay, wow. Um, you don't really have a functional media in this country. You don't have a media that is willing to ask tough questions to anybody in power. Whereas in England, you really do. Like the Sun and the Telegraph and, you know, the the even the Mirror, the left-wing, crappy, horrible socialist Mirror newspaper, they still make people uncomfortable on all political sides. And, and yes, you can argue that they do it to the right more than they do it to the left, but at least they still do it to the left. I've got no problem. You know, I'm a monarchist, but I've got no problem with them holding the royal family to account. A yeah. monarchist doesn't actually care about the family, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, this is what I always hear from my American friends, by the way. Oh, you know, Andrew's a pedophile. Yeah, I, I, yes. <laughs> you know, like, I, I'm not defending the people in the family. I'm defending the institution right. itself. Um, but yeah, you guys got you guys have nothing over here. Now, what's going to solve it in the long run, obviously, is the disintermediation of, of this sort of thing, right? But yes, it's still not. We still haven't reached the point where the production values are matched, and it's Correct. still, still going to take you and your producer hours to like cut this up and upload it and 
get clips and all of that stuff. Whereas they've got machines, right? Yep. Machines and institutions. That's why the best thing we can do as as right wingers in or you know, I speak for myself, in the UK is not dismantle the BBC, but take it over, right? Yeah. Like that, that's the play. Then you've got six, five, six billion pounds a year to play with. Um of course, everybody back home is still like, ax the BBC, ax the BBC. Yeah, all right, it's not going to happen. You've got to take it over and run it as it's supposed to be run. For as right-wing as, as and biased as I am, I think the National Pulse does a better job at the day-to-day -day news than, than most other websites in this country. And that's on the right and the left. Because we don't patronize people. Like, here's the story in 200 words or less. Now, fuck off, right? <laughs> like, right, right. I'm not and, and here's the time on site for 30 minutes. It's just not a metric I care about. And, and here's something else that, you know, people in the States don't appreciate. This used to be parodied on Saturday Night Live. PMQs, the prime minister in Great Britain, has to get on the floor of parliament and whoever wants to from the other opposition party or from their own party to a lesser extent can get up and get in their face and be like, you're terrible and you suck and, you know, you should be shot and all this other stuff where well, they can't get that personal. And just ask them what they want. And th that PM has to off the cuff you know, try to give reasonable, coherent, soundbite answers to questions that are often extremely legitimate things they don't want to be asked. And we can imagine how what that would be like if uh, uh, Joe Biden had to get on the floor of, of the House and Marjorie Taylor Greene gets to get up and get the mic. This <laughs> America would certainly be a different place. Let's put it that way. Yeah, your system's not really set up for it in that sense. I mean, no. I still think they should have that with, with, with every leader of every um, branch, right? I mean, when was... It's a good question. Has Joe Biden ever been in the White House press briefing room and given a, a press briefing from that lecture? Yeah, but remember they give him, they tell him who to call on, and they had what the questions that were going to ask ahead of time. Remember, well, I know he's done. I know he's done like, but that's at events, right? Where they do them in the um, right. They do them in that other room. Oh, God, the Rose Garden or the they do that. They've done them in the Rose Garden, but he's never actually stood up at that podium. And you'll remember that Trump used to love going and yes. standing up at that podium, right? Um, no, the, the PMQs thing is even more interesting because you said the prime minister has to. The prime minister doesn't have to. They still do it. They do oh. it out of the fact that they feel this is a robust way to be transparent and be... Now, listen, um, they're not getting asked all the questions they should be asked because the parliament is still two parties, right? Sure. Well, you got some Greens and you got some Lib Dems or whatever, but it doesn't yeah. really do anything. If you had a proportional representation system of uh, elections in England and you had that parliament be an English parliament, because quite frankly, if the Scots can have a parliament and the Welsh can have a national assembly, then the UK parliament should also have an English parliament element to it. Then you would get a um, lot more representation from the political right. You'd get a lot more representation from like the Greens. And then you get really tough questions aimed at the prime minister of the day. And I think that's coming in my lifetime. Um, are you white pilled or black pilled about the future of America? Well, we are so back because it's so over, right? Do you... So do you, know, do you know the references? No, I don't. So, so it's so over and we're so back are two like, um, like dark MAGA, you know, um, meme world America first catchphrases. It, it represents the, the, the black pill versus the, the white pill, right? We're so, it's all over. Forget about it it's you know decline in, in in and then it's and then it's we're so back no fucking yeah we're gonna rip rip it um and people use these like so often that now it's become a meme or i've tried to make it a meme um we're it's, it's so over because we're so back and we're so back because it's so over um so i'm kind of gray pilled to be honest with you like okay. there are days i wake up and i think oh my fucking goodness what are we even doing why are we fighting this silly fight like with the debt ceiling stuff right I can't stand this argument right now because the argument is basically, should we go bankrupt today or should we go bankrupt next year? <laughs> right? right. Like, that's, that's the level of argument that's being had on Capitol Hill right now. And I get that nerds uh, who dig the economic conversation, like they want in onto that conversation. Fine. It's not one for me. Um, but there are some days where I think, hold on a minute. You know, we have been bequeathed. Let's, let's use what David French uh, used to describe transgender reading hour. We have beque been bequeathed these blessings of liberty, right? And 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 this land, right? 
um, and, and, and everything it can do. And we've been told, we've never been told that any of it was going to be easy. We never were told that evil will not aggress us at every turn. So, uh, you know, I don't know how you feel about this now. I think probably the last time we talked, I would have planted my flag more in the atheist camp. I, I do not feel that way anymore. Um, I feel way more religious about things. I feel way more spiritual about things. And, and I think that needs to be reflected in the political campaign, by the way, of, of, of this coming election. I don't think you can say make America great again, again. I think you have to invoke spirituality now. And I would go, I would go, you know, this is make America glorious again and have glory be an overarching theme of the campaign because young people don't really think America's that great anyway. Um, and, but they do like glory, right? They like yeah. winning. Um, they like W's. They love flossing. <laughs> you know, they like they like the um, the battle royale victories. They like the um, the the perception of uh, grandeur, right? And so I think you have to you have to elevate the conversation to a different to a different place. And for me, if if the audience wants to do something cool after this, think on what I just said and play um, Elvis Presley live in Hawaii. Um, doing the American trilogy, right? Where at the end he's singing glory, glory, hallelujah. And you will see what I mean. That should be the theme song of Donald Trump's campaign. Raheem, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Your Zelensky t-shirt. <laughs> no, it's the you color. Are... Oh, <laughs> you are welcome. This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Pettisey. I love hearing people's stories of resilience and grit. This is why I created this podcast. We are very excited to welcome Jim Gaffigan, Yasmin Mohammed, Glenn Beck, Tim Dillon, Abigail Schreier, Jeff Garland, Ayan Hirsi Ali, Sam Harris, Heather Hying, Jonah Goldberg, Ben Shapiro, Glenn Greenwald, Sarah Shahi, Colin Quinn. If there's a culture of victimhood, then let's tell stories of grit and survival. Subscribe and listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.